I don't want to ever get over that event. Amen? And uh, it's in the spirit of that event this morning. As I pray that you keep that in mind as well, the event of your salvation this morning, as we look at, uh, at God's word and see what he has to say for us. You know, the Christian walk, ever since that day that I, I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, uh, not just my fire insurance, but my Lord, and my God, and, and, and I'll be the first to admit in 40 years I failed him miserably, uh, but he's always there when I come back to him. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins when we confess him, right? That's what it tells us in James. But You know, to our walk of faith is, uh, is, is spoke, spoke about throughout God's word, uh, especially in the New Testament. It's also in the Old Testament. One verse that comes to mind in the Old Testament, it talks about Enoch walked with God and then was no more. Wow, can you imagine that? We're walking so close to God and then not even have to experience his death. Just, and, and some of us may be that way. So we're, we're close enough to the rapture. Some of us may be walking with the Lord and he'll come back again. Amen? But our Christian walk is, is called a, a walk in the newness of life. Uh, we're told to walk in the spirit. We're told to walk as children of the light. Uh, there, there's a lot of verses that we could go through. You could do a study of the verses on the Christian walk in God's word. Uh, there is one verse of warning in 1 John 1, 16. It says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. If we say we have fellowship with him, but yet we're walking in darkness, we lie. We either are telling a lie that because we're not walking with him at the moment, that's not to say that we're lost. It could be that we're lost, but it also could mean that we're so far from him, so far backslidden and so far from him. Anyways, if you're walking in darkness, have you ever seen, you, you ever heard the, the expression, out of step, be out of step? Can you imagine the, uh, at a halftime show, the high school band, and, and somebody's out of step, kind of shows up, don't it? Or if there's a military march and somebody's out of cadence or out of rhythm or out of step, you know, they're a part of that band. They're a part of that military, but they get out of cadence. And that's like us as Christians. We are Christians, but sometimes our walk, we kind of get out of step. We get out of cadence. Sometimes we may not be a Christian. Sometimes some, there's some that don't have the same beliefs, uh, that don't believe in Christ, don't have the mind of Christ that we receive when we're when we're saved, and, and, it, that, that, and of course we don't instantly have his mind. His word tells us that we get in the word and, and he, he will change us into the image of his son. He, he, it, Romans 8, 29, he, his, he predestined us, predestinated us as we're saved to, to become in the image of Christ, be formed and be more like him. So we're going to look at that both ways today as we look at this. But if you would, as we read the text, stand in honor of God's word, John chapter 4, beginning in verse 46. We're going to look at four different steps of faith in this walk of faith, and by no means are they exhaustive. There are many others, but we're going to look at four here this morning. Beginning in verse John chapter 4, verse 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your word this morning as we look at some steps of faith. May it bring back memories of the steps of faith that we have taken in the past and may it be with us as we step out into, into out of this church and, 
and, and those steps of faith will need to be renewed and, and walked again and again that we can, we can sense your word and, and your facts of, of your life and the facts of our salvation, Lord. Father, we just thank you and praise you. May your will be done in the service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With this song, the song that we just saw, uh, you may be seated. The song we uh, just saw uh, was came from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we walk by faith and not by our circumstances. Uh, we have circumstances. There's times when circumstances can come into our life that, that will draw us closer to faith. I'm not saying that we don't have circumstances, but God is not a God of circumstances. Amen? And so we don't walk, we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by our feelings. What about Peter, Peter when uh, he stepped out of the boat? He asked Jesus if he could walk to him, and, and Jesus says, yes, come on. So Peter stepped out of the boat, and we don't know how many steps that he took, but he walked on water until, and that, as, long as, he, as long as he was walking by faith, as long as he had his eyes on Jesus, when he took his eyes off of Jesus and started seeing the boisterous sea around him, then he started walking by sight, and what happened? He started sinking. He had to call out for Jesus to save him, to help him. But I think about what I mentioned a while ago when I, I spoke briefly about the event in my life when I was saved, and, and I pray that each one of you hang on to that event when you were saved, not the experience, not the experience, but the event. The event is so much more important than the experience. We all have different experiences in salvation. If you hang on to the experience of your salvation, then you're hanging on to the feelings of your salvation. We need to hang on to the facts of our salvation, the, the event that it actually happened. If you, you may have a wonderful testimony, but then you may be at a, an, at a, at a, a group and someone gives a testimony about how they've been saved from drugs and this and that and the other, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the experience you had doesn't seem much like the experience they had. That's why we hang on to the event, not the experience. The event is what matters. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 10, 17 tells us how we walk by faith. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's how, that's how our faith grows, is by being in the word of God. That's how we have this faith. You've got to have a strong faith to walk by faith, don't you? You've got to be in the Word. You can't depend on experiences and feelings. You've got to have a strong faith. You've got to be in the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I'll be honest with you this morning. Normally I don't do this, but I want to ask you. I'm going to get you to raise your hands, and don't be ashamed, because I bet there's going to be more than one raise their hand. How many of you have read your horoscope first thing in the morning and then spent the day throughout the day as things happen, kind of say, oh, that's what that was talking about. Oh, how many of you have done that? I think at one time or another we've all done that. But you know what? Our quiet time in the morning with the Bible should be that way. We should read the Word and we should go throughout the day thinking, about, oh, when this event, oh, that's what God's Word was talking about. Oh, that's what it was. Oh, wow. It's not a coincidence. You know, like, those things that happened during the day as you were thinking about that horoscope, that was just purely coincidence. In fact, a lot of them you molded and fit and made it work, okay? You just made it fit that horoscope. But not if you get in God's Word. If you get in God's Word and spend quiet time with Him and meditate on His Word. Meditate it on it all day long. And as you're meditating on it, things will happen around you that will reinforce that Word, that will illustrate that Word. And that's what a walk by faith is. Uh, so what, what, what is faith? Our faith shouldn't be in faith. Our faith is in God, right? It's not a faith in faith. It's a faith in God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5 says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Put, it, put another word. Proverbs 3 puts it this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. We're not, we're not to the stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that brings us up to the message today. Uh, I want us to look and I want us to see four steps of faith. And again, by no means are these the only steps of faith, but we can definitely see four steps of faith in this passage this morning. The very first step of faith we see is in verse 47. It is a crisis faith. We talked a little bit about this this morning in Sunday school. 
When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and he besought him that he would come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. His son was at the point of death. This man had a crisis faith. This man had heard about just the verse before. Uh, in verse 45, it talks about uh, Jesus healing and, and all the things that he did in Jerusalem and that they had seen those. There's no doubt this man had seen some of those, definitely had heard about some of those. Uh, the, and so this crisis came up in his life, and he turned to God. Have you ever had a crisis in your life that would cause you to turn to God? Most of the time that happens, does it? When we have a crisis that comes up into our life, this man's son was at the point of death. How many of you heard about foxhole salvations? It's maybe a man's in the trenches, and, and bullets are zinging over his head, and he's scared to death. He has nowhere to turn but to God. That is a crisis faith. There's a crisis that comes up, and it leads you in faith. What about a deathbed? What about on, laying on your death? That's a crisis, is it not, that can cause you to turn to God. And those are things that, if you're a non-believer, can cause you to come to Christ, and, and, and he will draw you. God is faithful. He will draw you, and he may draw you through a crisis faith. But what about us as Christians? There's times when we can have a crisis faith as Christians. Maybe, maybe a lost job. That'll, that'll bring up a crisis, and, and you get on your knees, Lord, what do I do? You call, that crisis faith causes you to turn to him. Uh, maybe, maybe it's an illness. Uh, maybe it's a struggling church, and you get to a point, God, what do we do? But you, you, it's, almost a, it's almost to a point of crisis. You say, what do you do? You turn to him. God allows these circumstances to come up in our individual lives and in, in our corporate lives so that we'll turn to him. It's what I often refer to as a Red Sea moment. You'll hear me say that a lot. I, I, think, about, I think about the children of Israel. They got the Red Sea was in front of them and the Egyptian army was behind them and it's like, what do we do? God allowed them to get themselves in a place. Well, actually, he led them there. But they got to a place where only God could get them out of that situation. And sometimes he allows us to get ourselves, sometimes he leads us into situations where we have this crisis faith, where we get to a point to where we set self aside and we turn to him. That's where he wants us. You know, we, our best prayer life, my, I'm going to speak from experience. I shouldn't have said our, I should have said my, my best prayer life is usually when there's a crisis. How about you? Would you be honest and admit that? We're on a mountaintop. A lot of times we, we say a few prayers, but, you know, our prayer life's not as strong. But you let a crisis come into our life, and our prayer life will get strong, won't it? That's a shame that it's that way, isn't it? When we're on the mountains, when we ought to be really have a strong prayer life. But anyway, we see here that this man had a crisis faith. Uh, it had a crisis, and it drew him to faith. Verse 48 then says, Then Jesus said to him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, this is a warning to us. Again, to walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus is telling him, unless you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. And, and we're to walk by faith, not by sight. This warning is a very dire warning. It reminds me of Matthew 24 and 24 where it says, There shall rise, arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. You know, that old saying, seeing is believing. According to God's word, we need to, not, we need to, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Romans 8, 24 says that we are saved by hope, but a hope that is seen is not hope. A hope that is seen is not hope. The next thing I want you to see in the verse, we go from a crisis faith to a confident faith. Look with me, if you would, in verse 50. First of all, let me skip back. I, I got ahead of myself. Let me look at verse 49. This crisis faith brought this man to Jesus. I remember when I was saved. I've talked about that a lot. I, I hope I never get over that. I was invited by a friend to church. And, and there wasn't a crisis in my life. I was a 15-year-old boy. Just nothing wrong, with, nothing wrong with my life. I didn't have a crisis in my life. But by the end of the sermon, the Holy Spirit convicted me that I was a sinner. And I needed a Savior. All of a sudden, that's a crisis, is it? When you find out you're a sinner and, it, and you need a Savior, that is a crisis. And by the way, uh, y'all don't throw me out on my head when I say this. But think about it. I'm going to say something and then you think about it, okay? We sin. We're not sinners because we sin. 
we sin because we're sinners. We're born sinners. That's why we sin. We're born sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. But that Christ, so I was made aware that morning that I was a sinner. There's nothing I could do about it. And I say that because a lot of us as kids, uh, you know, at 15 you can get into a lot, but there's people here this morning that may have been saved at 7 or 8. Maybe you just told some lies or whatever. You told those lies because it's natural. You're born. Your mom and daddy didn't teach you to lie. Your mom and daddy didn't teach you to steal. You were born a sinner, and that's why you sin. That's why you do those things. But that crisis faith drew me to the Lord. Then I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't raised in church. And notice here in 49 where the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. We see here uh, a couple of errors in his faith. And, and it's, it's, when I say errors, maybe that's the wrong word. They're not necessarily errors in his faith. But, but he, it just shows that he don't know a lot about Jesus. He knew enough about him that when this crisis come to go to him, but he don't know a lot about him because he says, come down. In other words, in his mind, Jesus can help, but he's got to be present. He's got to come down to his house. He's got to be impressed. We know he don't have to be, does he? doesn't have to be. Also, he, he says, notice there, he says, ere my child die. His faith was, he, he came to him in a crisis, but here he, he looks and he thinks that if Jesus don't come to his house and heal his son, or if his son dies before he gets there, it's going to be too late. We all know better than that, don't we? But you don't have to know everything. When you come to faith, you, when that crisis faith called, you don't have to know everything. These things you'll learn along the way. There's nothing wrong with, with this man not knowing these things. He, he was just not aware of that. But also, as Christians, it reminds us how many times when we have a crisis in our life, we start giving orders to, G, to God. Instead of asking him, God, your will be done in this. We start telling him in our prayer how to handle it. He, you know, we say, come down and do this. Or come, we start telling, we, we hear about we're going to lose a job. Then we tell him how, we, how to save our job. Well, it may be his will that you lose your job. He may have a better one waiting on you. But we start telling him how to answer. This verse warns us of that to, to, t to keep us from, from doing that. Look at me, if you would, at verse 50 now. As, we, as his faith turns from a crisis faith to a confident faith. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him, and he went his way. Now, that's what we need to do. Isn't it? I remember I told you last week, I believe it was last week, maybe the week before, about the testimony of when I got saved, and the pastor told me that next week I needed to be baptized. I followed in obedience. I didn't know what all that meant, but I followed in obedience. This man right here, Jesus said, Go thy way, and what did he do? He went his way. You notice the obedience here in verse 50? It's a comp he had enough confidence in, in Christ. Even though he didn't know everything about him, he had enough confidence in him to be obedient. We see here this confidence. Faith. It's obedience. You know, when God created us, he gave us two legs and two feet. If we're born naturally, there's some that are born without that, and there's a purpose for that. But for the most part, we're born two legs and two feet. And, you know, think about it. God could have, we could have been born uh, as a hovercraft just to go around anywhere. You know, we, he could have done whatever he wanted to, right? But he gave us two legs and two feet. You know why I think? Uh, Adrian Rogers used to always talk about the old T&O Railroad, the trust and obey, the tracks. Uh, the T&O Railroad ran on the trust and obey, the two tracks. Well, I think, I think God gave us two feet, and one of them's trust and one of them's obey. It's one step at a time. This walk of faith is one step at a time. You just... Take one step of trust and another step of obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. This confident faith uh, is, is it, it, obedience. We show our confidence in who we believe in by being obedient. There may be some of you here this, here this morning that have been saved but have never been baptized. That's the first commandment we're given once we're saved is to be baptized. We're not saved by that baptism. There's some people that believe that, but we're not. It's, it is a water baptism. It is our profession of faith it, that we have died to self and that we are raised to a newness in life. We are following Jesus in, in the grave, and we're in a watery grave, and we're raised a new person. We are raised. It's a, and so if you're not obedient to that, you're not willing. God's word tells us if we're ashamed to, to he, he will not. If we don't witness to men, he won't witness to the Father, right? We've got to, we've got to be obedient. And it's hard. It's hard. It, that step of faith, take one step at a time, you've got to have the faith and the obedience. Too many, too many of us, 
We want to skip a few steps and then maybe pick up a step of obedience. But you've got to be obedient to everything the Lord lays on your heart. That is what a walk of faith is, is, is to be obedient to everything that he lays on our heart. Then I want you to notice in, in verse 51 and 52, his crisis faith then became a confident faith, and now I want you to see how it became a confirmed faith. And now as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. They said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour which Jesus said to him. I want you to notice that the confirmed faith, that confirmed faith will give you a peace that surpasses understanding. That confirmed faith, you remember when you were saved did it, and, and other times, do you remember times when you've had a crisis come into your life and you've turned to God and you've prayed and you stood up from that prayer with a confident faith and a confirmed faith because that peace that passes understanding has rested upon you, that weight, that burden that was on you, it feels like you're light. I mean, that burden is gone. We talked about it last week. Another part of confirmed faith is is the fruits of the Spirit we see in Galatians 5. Also the fruits, the gifts of the Spirit that we see in 1 Corinthians 12. But that confirmed faith, his son was healed. And, and, you know, a lot of people today say there's just not a lot of miracles that happen today like they did in Bible times. Well, in other countries there is. It's amazing. You go on a mission field and you'll see miracles that happen. Miracles are a testimony of what God is doing and that Jesus is who he says he is. And you know what? I believe that the greatest miracle ever that's happened to any of us is salvation. That's a miracle. When you believe that the birth of a baby is a miracle, I believe that a birth of a natural birth of a baby is a miracle, is it not? It's only something only God can do. Well, so is our spiritual birth. That's something only God can do. That's a miracle. So you can't say that we don't see miracles happen. God is still in the saving business. And when people get saved, you just witness witnessed a miracle. I had this confirmed faith. He had it here. And I want you to notice he said when he began to amend. And they told him that in the seventh hour his fever, why it left him. Now sometimes God will heal us over days. Sometimes he'll heal us instantly. He can do it. His will be done. But then we see that his faith that started out as a crisis faith, became a confident faith, and then a, a confirmed faith turned into a contagious faith. Verse 53, so the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, thy son liveth and himself believed. And what does it say after that? And his whole house. A contagious faith. You know, we see that in other, other passages. We see that when Peter and, I mean, Paul and Silas was thrown into jail, had been beaten and thrown into jail, and then they were singing. They wasn't crying and saying, pity me and having a pity party. Were They were in jail. They'd just been beaten, and they were, at midnight, they were singing praises to God, weren't they? They weren't having a pity party. They was walking by faith. Not They weren't looking at the circumstances around us. They was praising God. He counted them worthy to go through what they went through. They were thrown there because they had been witnessing and preaching the gospel while they were thrown there. They sang at midnight, and what happened? An earthquake, and the, and the chains fell off, and the doors were open, and the jailer was responsible for all these. He figured everybody had escaped, and he's getting ready to take his life. And, Peter, and Paul says, no, we're here. We're all here. And what did it say? That man believed, and, and went, went just like, that man believed in his whole household. There's other areas in Bible in God's Word where it talks about where someone was saved. What about the woman at the well when, when, when she was saved? What did she do? She went into town and says, "Y'all got to come see a man that told me everything that I did," and, and she brought everybody out. That was a contagious faith. A contagious faith. Is your faith contagious this morning? I remember when I first got saved, it was more contagious probably than today. And I'm ashamed to say that. When I first got saved, I wanted to tell everybody about what had happened. And pretty soon you let that fire go down, don't you? But it just begins to be. We need to flame that fire. That, of that event when we were saved, we need to flame that fire. And that memory, not again of the experience, but that event. And we need to go and tell others what, what God has done for us. So is your saving faith, is it still contagious? Is it as contagious as it should be? I don't think it ever needs to, is as contagious as it should be, but it's something that we can strive for. But also, is our walk of faith contagious? 
There's people that can see us go through things and see how we handle it in our walk of faith, see how we handle that, and, and that may even bring them to Christ. Just saying, wow, I can't believe they went through that, and look, look at their faith. Is your walk of faith contagious? In closing, let me ask you one more time. Is your saving faith contagious? Is your walk of faith contagious? Let me tell you some things that can cause it not to be. If we start walking by sight instead of faith, then our saving faith won't be contagious. It, it, our, our walk of faith won't be contagious. If you walk by reason, what would that look like? If you walk by reason, we, t we, we read a verse where we shouldn't stand in the wisdom of men or lean on our own understanding. If you walk by reason, you may be walking in the wrong direction. If you're walking in the wrong direction, then your faith's not going to be contagious. Or if you're walking in feelings, what do you think walking in feelings instead of walking by faith, if, if you were walking by feelings instead of what, what do you think that would look like? I can imagine if you're walking by feelings, just walking in circles. Just walking in circles. Can you imagine that? Have you ever been there? I've been there. I, I, it feels like just, just doing a lot of walking, a lot of motion, but not getting anything done, or almost like a leaf just floating down a stream, walking by feelings. What about walking by in fear? fear? Fear is a good thing. You know, God gives us fear, uh, but God's word, there's a lot of places in God's word where he says, fear not. But there's a lot of times we should fear. Fear can be health, healthy. I mean, if you're walking down an Appalachian Trail and a, you see a copperhead, it's a pretty good thing that you're afraid of that copperhead. So fear can be a good thing. But Satan's taken a lot of things that are good that God has given us that are good, and we could name a bunch of things that God has given us that is a blessing, and, God, and Satan has turned them into sin. Fear. Sorry, I won't mention this. Uh, our relationships with our wives and husbands. That's a good thing God has created, but Satan taken, and he, ha he has that going on outside of marriage and before marriage and so on. Satan takes and, 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 and takes something that's good of God. But, so this fear that I'm talking about, walking by fear, is just a walking in place. You're walking by fear, not the fear of the Lord, but just a fear, the fear that Satan would give you. If you're walking by fear, you're just walking in place. Not walking or forward, just walking in place. If you're doing that, then your faith is not contagious. Neither your saving faith nor your walk of faith. What about this? Walking by selfish desires. Too many times we walk by selfish desires. One of, one of the ways that can look in walking by in selfish desires could be just stepping on whoever. Didn't don't matter. If it gets you where you're going, it doesn't matter who you step on. We shouldn't do that. But also... Walking by selfish desire is placing our will ahead of God's will. Placing our will ahead of God's will. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. Not by our feelings, not by reason, not by fear, but by faith. And we have so much of God's promises that we can, that we can trust and we can know for fact. We can know for a fact the event of our salvation. Yeah, sometimes we don't feel saved. That's an emotion. Base it on facts. Base it on the event, not on the feelings. Do you want your saving faith to be contagious once more? Do you want your walk of faith to be contagious once more? I, I think about on Wednesday night, and, and I'm just a guest speaker here, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for inviting me to, to be a guest speaker here. It, it is a blessing to be here. Um, and I thank you for that. I appreciate that opportunity. But I, I can't help but pray for you. I hear your prayers. I hear your prayers for the church. I see your concerns for the church. And, 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 and you want this to be, uh, once again, a beacon on a hill. Not, not the light, but a beacon on a hill that will draw people to the light. A beacon on a hill that would, would be a, a, a place of refuge for the lost. A place of refuge for the hurting. A beacon, you remember, I remember as a kid, I'm giving my age away again. I did that first of all when I said I was been saved for over four decades earlier. But you remember years and years ago when, when they used to have these big spotlights. I guess they were military surplus. They don't use them looking for planes anymore, so they... 
when a, a new store was opening up or something that's having a grand opening, they have one of them big spotlights. And you'd see the spotlight just crossing the sky. Do you remember ever seeing those spotlights crossing the sky and you get in the car and go see what's going on, see where it started from? And that's what I'm talking about. We, this church needs to be the beacon on a hill that's shining that light that people would want to come and see what's going on and come to the true light, want to come to the light. The church is not the light, but we, we, we are, Christ is the light that would point people to come, the beacon on the hill that would point people to come to the bread of life. That, that would get people, and there's so many people out there that's right now in the middle of a crisis, and they need to be introduced to the one that can help give them this crisis faith, and then a confident faith, and then a contagious faith. But I pray for y'all. And I was thinking the other night as I was praying, or one more, maybe one morning in my quiet time as I was praying, the thought crossed my mind. Uh, if you're not here on Wednesday nights, you miss a blessing to see all those kids. And I thank you, church. I thank you that you've invested in those kids, that you invest in them on Wednesday night. Knowing that they're not going to be here this morning. I don't know how many churches would do that. You're not investing in this church. You're investing in the church, okay? The church. And you're, you're going out and picking up these kids and you're witnessing to them and, 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 and serving them and, and discipling them. You're investing in them. And that, that ought to be contagious not only in the youth department, but that ought to be contagious in the, in the singles department, in young married department, in the, in the seniors department. Just see what's going on there and let that be contagious. Let that excite you. What's, go, what's going on there can go on in other parts of the church. And I, I pray for you. I know it's what your des- I know it's your desire. I think God's placed that desire in your heart, and God's word tells us that He'll give us the desires of our heart. Keep on praying. Walk by faith, not by sight. Don't look around you and see that there's a lot of empty pews this morning and go away discouraged. Be encouraged that God's in control. God's at work. God's got a plan. Keep praying and keep looking to Him. Look to Him. Walk by faith and not by sight. If you're here this morning, if you've never experienced this walk, you've never been saved, you've never, then, and everything, a lot of the things that I've just talked about doesn't really apply to you yet, but it can. It can. If you're here this morning, you've never taken that walk of faith. Years ago, have you ever heard, have you ever heard the aisle called the Sawdust Trail? You ever heard that? There used to be Tent revivals, a lot of tent revivals. They used to be really big, and of course they'd come in, set up the tents, and they'd put sawdust, and they'd be people. We we talk about walking the aisle, but people would say, "Walk those." I walked the sawdust trail. It's talking about in a tent revival, they came forward. There's something about that profession of faith. There's something about being baptized in publicly as a, a step of obedience. There's something about there's something about walking the aisle. That's setting your will. I don't care what anybody thinks. Or anybody says, I'm walking the aisle. God has called me to come forward, and I'm going forward. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to take that step of faith and obey, trust and obey. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, I, I plead with you to do that before this day is over. Do it before this service is over, but do it before today's over. If you're here this morning and you want to send that white flag of surrender, Lord, I've had enough of walking by sight. I've had enough of walking by feelings and walking by fear. I want to lay my will down. I want to, I want to surrender to you, and I want to walk by faith. If you're here this morning and you, you feel that way, would you come forward as well? Just Your coming forward may cause someone else to come forward. But let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you that you give us the grace, the strength, 